Well, Mr. Goda, having reported these issues for a while, this is not the very first to hear governments considering this kind of move. We've seen that before. But this particular one now, any difference in terms of their approach and what we do, our capacity in the country? Is this or will this be a right move? Yes, I would say it's a uh, right move. Let me say that uh, uh, the president actually showed there's a bit of recourage in reappointing uh, Mr. Godwin initially as the CBN governor. Um, because uh, <clears throat> uh, given all the things that preceded the reappointment, we were thinking that uh, uh, powers will really bring him down, but the president showed courage. And then uh, I think uh, what I have also seen is that uh, some economic interest, power blocks, <laughs> they tend to take this uh, CBN governor for granted. Maybe because of his soft disposition. Uh, he is a professional to the core. He doesn't uh, join issues and all of that. He is so concerned about the mandate. And so he is not the person that will go on the rooftop and uh, make proclamation, making political statements. And so they take it for granted that maybe he doesn't have the will to push through certain things. When those ban on those uh, items, 41 or so items, from the forest window started, they thought he was going to was going to cave in, but he didn't. And if you meet the president personally, I've done so, if you meet him personally, he's so pained about certain things about this country, about the way country, this country is run. He will be asking, why is it that we are importing food? What? Where is all the rice pyramid? Where is, he will be asking all those things. But it seems not to just get it right on who to drive the point home for him. And so, with Emevele coming and doing all of that, uh, people thought that uh, it's not going to be sustainable. But he's going to go ahead. What is the problem, all the problems between uh, China and uh, the U.S.? Because China exports everything and imports nothing. And so what we can produce, why should we import? For now, it's going to be, yes, in the short term, it's going to be difficult. But in the long run, all the factors will come in, and there will be stability. And then people will begin to enjoy the benefit of the policy. You know, one of the people who, uh, the agencies, to answer some of these questions, is the mm. Agric Ministry. Yes. Uh, but we've got someone, well, he used to be in the Agric Ministry. It's not that he's <laughs> there now, so well, he may escape. He's a, uh, Mr. Olali Kokwadri. He is a former director of plantation and uh, cooperatives with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, about Thank you, this, Chamberlain. Yeah, about and this particular policy. Yeah, we, we, we know that previously, even lately, when it has to do with rice, we've heard some of the, the manufacturers here say, yes, the government has put some sort of restriction uh, for rice importation, but they have a challenge. It has to do with smuggling, uh, then they talk about access to credit. Then they talk about how they perform the challenges they face with their farms here. And all of those seem to raise questions about whether or not we have that capacity to meet the local demand if we go ahead and ban some of these products. So do you think that, and these realities that we should actually consider if we should go ahead and ban all of this? Thank you, Chaplain. And good morning, viewers. Um, I think it is good that we ban some of these items, as the CBN governor has uh, rightly mentioned. But I think more importantly, uh, we need to get the value chain correctly. First and foremost, there are three pillars. There are three things that you need to do to, to get every value chain successful. And the three things are basically, one, you must get your research correct. Secondly, the extension system must be correct. And thirdly, the market. These three things are very key. So if you don't have them put in place and you, blan you ban, you are just going to create crisis in the land. So it is important for us to give attention to these three pillars that I've mentioned vis-a-vis -vis research. For example, I was in India in February this year for the Global Pastor Conference. And then um, they got the lady that the, the farmer, the lady farmer that got the highest price, got um, eight tons per hectare. 
eight metric tons per hectare. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, for the same castor, you have 300 kg. So that means there is no how any castor grower in Nigeria can be globally competitive. And of course, it might interest you to know that today, India gets about 2.1 billion annually from castor export to other countries, especially China. And then secondly, extension. Our extension system in Nigeria, for example, has collapsed completely. It's only Federal Ministry of Agriculture that is trying, and some few other states that are trying to put this um, particular aspect of agriculture together. Because without the extension, even the research findings in the, in the, in the, in, from the universities or from Agricultural Research Institute, there is, I mean, there is no way it can get to the farmers. And there is no way Nigerian farmers can actually ad begin to adopt new technology. And the third one, of course, is the market. In the, in the case of market, uh, our Amibu vice president mentioned about three, four years ago or something, he said that um, the federal government was going to implement or go back to the commodity boards. But up to now, nothing has been heard since that time. And I believe that um, uh, probably they are still working on it, but it is important for us to get our commodity boards right. For example, you may recall that um, in, the, in the 80s, the commodity boards were scrapped. And when they were scrapped, Ghana, on, in his own case, refused to scrap the board because um, based on the IMF recommendation and, um, or, or, or World Bank. And today, Ghana is one of the leading countries in cocoa in the world today. So these are some of the things I believe that um, for us to successfully ban some of these items, yeah, you can, but if you don't put some of these things in place, then you are going to run the risk of um, 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 importation and not the rest of them, and that will definitely not um, augur well for the Nigerian economy. And of course, you will not be able to create the necessary uh, job that is needed by our teaming population. And in the case of research, let me tell you this. Most of our agricultural research institutes today, they are not functioning very well. Why? Because uh, our attention is not being given to them. There is no enough resources. You know, research is actually public good. And um, that it requires a lot of investment. So, uh, like CBN now that wants to intervene in North Palm, uh, in North Palm Valley chain, I don't know how they are going to do that because um, uh, if you don't finance research, I mean... I, I wonder, look, for example, now, some farmers presently, I must tell you for a fact, that they are importing um, seedlings, I mean, the sprouted nuts. That is what you use to grow uh, palm, uh, palm, uh, oil palm, oil palm seedlings. They are importing them from Malaysia and Indonesia and Taiwan. So why? Because you are, like, you are going to get higher yield. NIFO is trying its bit, but then they need modern equipment, they need technology to be able to drive this sector appropriately. So it is important for government to support our research institute so that they can be globally competitive and they, so that they can also deploy uh, cutting edge technology so that they can produce, I mean, they can make available planting materials to our farmer, generate new technologies that can make our farmer to be globally competitive. Now, for Mr. example, Kodri, the rice value chain that you are talking about, for example. Mr. Kodri, if I may, uh, apologies. Now, you mentioned research. That's one of the three pillars you mentioned. And you've talked about agricultural institutes. But I'd like us to take it to the consumers, because the average Nigerian doesn't exactly know what's happening in the agricultural institute. Yes, that's important. But then there are areas we need to also look at. For example, consumer preference. Well, why do people choose to import these things? Probably because of the price. Simple thing as packaging. I mean, it goes on and on. So the question is, is this being done? I mean, we can focus on the research in the agricultural institutes, but then for the people consuming this, because uh, Mr. Ogbodo said, the president asked, I mean, why do people import? Why do Nigerians really value importation of foreign goods? So the question is, is this being done? Shouldn't this be something we are also looking into? Yes, yeah, people, uh, people import, not because Nigerians are desirous to eat, eat import, but the question is, when those things are not available, where, one of the reasons is that the price is one of the factors. And the reason why price is a huge factor is because Nigerian farmer, an average Nigerian farmer, is not globally competitive. Like I told you, in the case of rice, China produces 15 metric tons per hectare in the case of rice. And Nigeria, still, we are still jubilating with 6, 7 tons per hectare. So definitely there is a huge difference. And so, when, when, and don't also forget that some of these countries also, they are subsidizing the agri sector. And Nigeria, in Nigeria, everybody will tell you oh, there is no need, uh, agri is a business, there is, no need to, to, there is no need for subsidy when America itself supports its farmers with subsidies. 
So we are getting the whole thing wrong. And um, as long as we don't support our farmers, as long as we don't make our intra, I mean, uh, loans available to our farmers at sing single digit rate, then we are not going to be globally competitive. And when that happens, there will always be food shortage. And when there is food shortage, then it encourages importation. And of course, some, uh, let me also say this with due respect, that some countries are also bent on making sure that agricultural system does not work in Nigeria. What do I mean by that? By the time they subsidize, they subsidize agricultural production in their country, they make sure that they keep on sending food to Nigeria. Because why? They believe that we have oil money. And I don't think that is correct. So our government needs to wake up to, our, to their responsibility by supporting our farmers, create an enabling environment, and uh, make uh, agribusiness agri more and more uh, profitable to the people. And once we do that, like I said, research is very key. Extension is very key. Market is very key. In the case of market, for example, the price of cashew, I mean, the price of cashew, for example, in 2016 was 700,000 naira per metric ton. And the price fell down to 200,000 per metric ton as of 2017, 2018. I mean, can you imagine that? And nobody is saying anything. This, everybody is quiet. Whereas there is need for us to, to, to have an emergency meeting of all stakeholders and see how can we address this problem. And what was the cause? It was just because the Vietnamese and the Indians that were buying this cashew from Nigeria were no longer forthcoming. And so the Nigerian farmers were at loss. So we, there is need for government to intervene in the area of marketing so that they can come up with this marketing board, see how they can address some of these challenges. And let me also tell you for a fact that if the uh, commodity board are in place, you find out that research will be taken care of. Extension also will be taken care of. And of course, the livelihood of the farmers will be sustained. Now, Mr. Mr. Kwadri, let me ask you this. Uh, this is not the first time the CBN or government at you know, the federal level would uh, put a clamp down on certain products saying oh, we, we're not importing these anymore. I was the time we stopped, it was legislated that we should stop importing toothpaste, stop importing uh, toothpicks and, you know, the likes. And the, the CBN has, uh, the federal government has put a ban on palm oil importation and all of that. And now it's going to uh, milk. Do you think we have enough capacity to produce locally enough? Because drawing from what you said earlier, uh, we are still grappling with the quantity that can feed or supply our 200 million man population. Do you think that for some of these products that have been banned, do you think we have enough to provide for our people at home? Or do you think we have enough capacity to produce enough for our people? Thank you very much. Um, I believe that um, first and foremost, let, we, we must realize that Nigeria has 81 million hectares of land. Nigeria also has over several million cubic meters of water, and we have sunshine, you know, virtually throughout the year. So Nigeria, and of course, we have the human resources. Nigeria has the potential to produce, to meet its food uh, as, uh, requirements. But the only thing is the, the challenge that we are facing is that there is need for favorable policy environment for people to be able to thrive. For example, let me tell you for a fact, about a few weeks ago, I, I was in uh, Oshun State, and I went to, uh, to tender my oil palm farm. And um, while I was there, Fulani has men brought their cattle to my farm to eat some of these, uh, so, uh, what do you call it, uh, my, my oil palm seedlings that are still trying to grow on the field. So these are issues that the federal government needs to address as quickly as possible. Create ranches, make sure that um, the, these farmers' headers clashes are minimized to the, to, the, uh, to the barest minimum. And of course, I tell you that the Nigerian farmers, they are very intelligent, they are hardworking. There are a lot of people that are into agribusiness now, but they need to be supported, they need to be encouraged. The era of using cutlasses and hoes to do farming is, is gone for good. So there is need for massive importation of tractors into the country. There is need for us to, to be able to mechanize our operations. There is need for farmers to move from the smallholder farmers to commercial farmers. That is the only way to, that's the right way to go. Because if, you are, if, 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 a, if a farmer is still producing less than one hectare, you know, still managing less than one hectare, two hectares, that cannot take us anywhere. There is need for mechanization. There is need for us to increase our, our, our acreages. 
For example, uh, if you are if you if you have a if you have a farm now, and maybe a maize farm or a rice farm or something, anything less than five hectares, you are just wasting your time because you are not likely to 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 produce at an economic scale. So there is the, the, the Nigeria the, 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 in the Nigerian system, we have the people, we have the we have the, 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 the farmers, we have the uh, what do you call it? We, we 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 have the sunshine, we have the water and everything. All that is needed to be done is those things that are mentioned earlier on. And once they are done, and gov of course, government also may, must make sure that all our porous borders, they are adequately taken care of, because that is beyond the purview of an, uh, of an average uh, Nigerian farmer. You all right, uh, uh, Mr. Quadri, uh, uh, just one quick one here. I remember you talked about you know, infrastructure in the rural areas and all of that, and of course, that should be a concern as well. Uh, we, we remember that back in time, in the 90s, there was DFRI and MAMSA and all those other things. What is the state of rural infrastructure like, and how helpful is that for farmers to bring their produce to, to, to the markets? Well, that is one of the greatest challenges that we are also having in the, in the agri sector. And, um, of course, you and I know that um, the federal government does not have all the resources it takes to develop our rural sector, even though the, rural, the Department of Rural Development is doing a lot in terms of water provision, in terms of rural roads construction, in terms of rural market. But then that is just a tip of an iceberg. There is need for massive investment in the, in the, in the, in the area of infrastructure because uh, as I'm talking to you now, several villages cannot bring out their produce from the, from, from, from the hinterland just because of poor uh, rural, rural road infrastructure. So there is need for us to do what I can call massive investment in the area of rural infrastructure. And don't also forget that um, agriculture is on the concurrent list. So the state government also must wake up from their slumbers. And of course, the same thing with local government, because some of these roads that we are talking about, I mean, uh, a lot of people have said that um, uh, whatever the federal government is doing is just a little bit. It's just it's doing its own bit. The state government needs to wake up. They need to deploy some of these their resources instead of buying place or uh, building uh, uh, what we call elephant projects all over the place. They should deploy these their resources to rural areas. And of course, you will, they will make more money by the time they deploy their resources to some of these uh, rural communities, so that uh, those those agrarian communities can actually produce more, and then those food can get to the market at cheaper prices. And then uh, they can also be preserved because we have losses. For example, cassava. If you okay. have cassava, Mr. Godey, just, just pardon me. We'll come back to you to speak about this marketing board and how she work. But Mr. Godey, having listened to him, uh, clearly challenges exist there. So how much of that can CPN do? Are they actually mindful of us from these challenges? Because it's not just about placing these bans. Uh, yeah, you made some very valid point. But, uh, you know, the Nigerian mindset is not actually a very good mindset. We just think that uh, things should be decreed. Nothing is decreed. Everything is developed. And there is always a starting point. You understand? When the, those 41 items were banned, you know, it induced a kind of backward integration that the, the companies, manufacturers now, we are now looking inward for raw materials internally. And so in the short run, of course, there will be dislocations and attendant pains. But in the long run, things will start to stabilize. All the things he has said now, of course, is something that would have um, been taken care of in, in terms of skimming out the program, the policy. Definitely, uh, there will be a, a lot of credit for people to develop capacities in the various areas along the value chain of agriculture. You take the issue of the, of the milk, for instance. Uh, yes, what, what are the international best practices? Uh, uh, how much milk can a cow produce? These are all the things that may be taken into consideration. And it has to be developed. You don't decree it. But if you don't start, then you are not going to move. That is my, that is my viewpoint. If you don't start, you're not going to move. And then um, the, uh, uh, the palm produce, you know, there is always this uh, story we talk about uh, Malaysia or wherever that uh, coming to knife or in Benin there. To take seedlings and now they now turn out to be the the world largest producer of palm oil. It's not exactly the way we are looking at it. So if somebody is coming back to you to say, look, we can do this, but we can now build capacities in the various departments and maybe do it well. Mr. Quadri, let me just read out the stats, you know, so you can speak to 
uh, the question about the marketing boss. Now, this report says Nigeria has the potential market for 1.3 million tons of milk valued at 450 billion naira annually. Now, of that estimated its total domestic fluid market, fluid milk production in 2016, uh, 2006, I beg your pardon, the report here says only about 600,000 liters. That's what about 232.5 million naira entered the formal market through informal channels. This marketing board that you've spoken about, how should we go about it? Well, it, we, uh, we don't actually, thank you, Chamberlain, we don't actually need to reinvent the wheel. In the 70s and 80s, marketing boards were created, and, um, and you have, uh, I mean, they were created uh, for, for, for Grand North, for Cocoa, for Oil Palm, and then um, they were doing exceptionally well, even though they have some issues. But, um, I mean, all we need to do, instead of making it a all-government a, a, a all affair, it should be both private and public sector combined together to form this board. It is very, very important. I, uh, like I told you earlier on, in the uh, early part of this year also, the event, since two years ago, the price of cocoa fell from 1, one million naira per ton to 500,000 naira. And nobody is saying anything. The farmers are crying. You know, they are just at the receiving end. The same thing with cashew, the same thing with some of these commodities. Even maize also, the price also fell. So there is need for us to actually come back to this issue of marketing ball, both private sector and the public sector. Or let us take a key from other countries that are doing well. Uh, Cordova has a board, Ghana has a board, has a board, uh, Malaysia has a board. Most of these countries that are doing well in the agribusiness, they have board that are controlling or regulating the sector so that um, they are able to take care of a lot of things. Like the issue of extension, for example, can be taken care of by the, by, by the board from the proceeds they are earning from, uh, from export. That is the money they are going to plow back into the same system again. And let me also use this opportunity to say that uh, what CBN, do, uh, CBN is doing is good. But I think more importantly, there is need for CBN and Ministry of Finance to pay their capital share, share for, I mean, to Bank of Agriculture. Bank of Agriculture is an institution which will allow our institution to function. Are you, I, I don't know whether you are getting my point. We should allow our institution to function. Bank of Agriculture was created to be able to, to deal with the issue of agricultural financing. But today it has been relegated to the background. And the, all we hear is Anchor Bora program, all this and that. But I think uh, the, 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 the Bank of Agriculture should take its rightful place. And when this does not happen, it will be difficult for us to develop some of these sectors. But like I said, marketing board is very, very important, very, very crucial. If we don't do it, the, we, will continue to, we will continue to wallow in confusion and then we will know what the problems are and we will not know how to address them. So it is important for us, as a, I mean, for the government to take a second look at this marketing board. The, like, like I said earlier, the vice president promised that uh, they were going to do something about it. And we are still expecting. And I believe that uh, most of these uh, uh, actors in the sectors, they will be very happy by the time this board co comes, uh, comes on stream so that it will be able to address some of the fundamental challenges. And it will also save government a lot of money, a lot of resources. By the time the board is created, because they will be able to address some of these challenges, like the issue of research that I told you is public good. They will be able to know which area of research. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one. So uh, we'll see. We'll keep tabs uh, and keep focus on this. Even states, too, uh, they've got a job of work to do as well. Those are some of the issues we'll focus on in the days ahead. But this is how far we can go here today. Mr. Olali Kwadri, former director of plantation and cooperatives with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture. We also had Mr. Abraham Gouda, former editor with The Guardian. Thank you for coming.